Welcome everybody uh, to our seventh installment of the Terrebonne 200 series. Uh, this one on cultivating, um, cultivating Terrebonne Parish in agriculture. Before we get started, I'd like to um, ask uh, Miss Margie Scobie if you could come up and say a prayer, and uh, 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 Councilman Dirk Gidry can. Uh, I tell you what, Lee Schaffer is going to say a prayer. <laughs> Delegated. That's Miss. Ms. Marge is a good delegator. Go ahead, Lee, and uh, Councilman Dirk Gidry will uh, lead us in the pledge. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We ask you uh, to give blessings upon all of us as we uh, share our history and our culture and all the things that make us, uh, make us a, a, a community together. We ask these things to your name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You'll all rise and praise the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilman Guidry. And I'd also like to uh, recognize uh, former parish president, Michelle Claude. Uh, welcome. Um, again, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Councilman, uh, Council Chairman Darren Guidry. And I'm glad to welcome you all here this evening to um, our segment on agriculture. Uh, of course, the oil industry is really big in Terrebonne Parish today, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, the, the main staples of our economy, which built our economy, were seafood and agriculture. And we're going to hear a little bit about that history on agriculture today. So with uh, no further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Ms. Cherie Roger, who is going to uh, lead us in the presentation on cultivating Terrebonne. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Guidry. And we would like to thank um, Terrebonne Parish and President Dove and the council for all their help with our presentation this year. After we said the pledge, I almost wanted to say the 4-H pledge because as a 4-H agent at a 4-H meeting, you always say the American pledge first and then the 4-H pledge. <laughs> okay. Okay, so when I think of the word agriculture, hard work, determination, sacrifice, service, and family are all words that come to mind. Although Terrebonne Parish is not noted for um, agriculture today, at one time, it was what brought many people here. Sugarcane was and remained um, a popular cash crop in the area. So this is an excerpt from Dr. Sinak's um, book. I'm very thankful that Dr. Sinak and Marty helped with this presentation and getting this information um, in, in this order. Sugarcane was a popular um, commodity, but there were many other um, commodities in the parish, such as rice, cotton, soybean, um, and such. Okay, so um, early planters tried to grow many different crops. Again, we said rice, corn, tobacco, cotton, potatoes, and soybeans were grown, grown in the parish. Um, and, and many families had, had to rely on themselves. And I, before we started, I heard many people reminiscing about what they had to do in order to get that food. Um, and so, you know, a lot of families had cows for milk and meat, hogs, chickens, and so forth. Um, one thing in the research that I realized was, was some of the commodities um, that we had long ago that were popular that we don't have that much of today. So corn, for example. Um, we still grow corn, but just not as much. We're not using it as much um, 
residence plantation is going to, Mr. Dr. Gadry is going to talk about that in a little bit, how they used to use um, the corn, rice. That blew my mind. I did not realize that rice was grown here at one time. But of course, today, we don't have that. And then potatoes. Okay. So in the early 1800s, sugarcane um, was became popular. It was measured in hogshead, and each hogshead was a um, thousand pounds. It was produced in Terrebonne Parish from 1861 to 62. The highest number of sugarcane producers was 145. That's kind of hard to believe. When we ha almost, um, I think we're right at nine this year. Um, this present day. In um, 13, I think that was the number when, the, when Dr. Sinak's book was written. Okay, this may be. Okay. So this is a list of um, the producers and how much cane was produced in those years. South Down Plantation. No, let's see. I do want to recognize Mr. Prosper Toops for helping me with this presentation as well um, and, and getting me a lot of information about South Down. Um, so South Down, of course, is, is one of the plantations that's well known in our area. In 1856, the first mill was built under the ownership of William Minor with family members. Um, Conrad Crumbar, David Pipes, and the chemist Elliot Jones. In the early 1920s, they purchased additional plantations, including Concord, Mandalay, Hollywood, Greenwood, and Oak Forest. In the latter part of the 1920s, they also purchased waterproof crest and crescent farms. And this brought a total acreage to South Down um, at roughly 22,000 acres, with about um, was it 900 or 9,000 acres in sugarcane, Mr. Prosper? Do you remember? Nine thousand, nine thousand. I think that was a typo on my part. That's why I asked. Um, and so South Down got its, its name from the South Down sheep. They also had a dairy, and that was something interesting that I learned was that a lot of these plantations were very diverse in the, the commodities that they had on their plantation. Um, transportation was not always easy, and so there were many mills built on each plantation or each farm. Um, mills were built on Greenwood, Oak Forest, Argyle, Mandalay, Waterproof, Magnolia, Ordorn, and Crescent Farms. And as transportation improved, these mills were phased out and went to South Down. And um, these are the trains that were used um, to transport the cane. I was, it was interesting to know that Coca-Cola was one of um, the biggest um, buyers of the sugar from South Down to put in their, um, in their product. There's some more of South Down. So this, these two pictures are quite interesting. So the top picture is South Down in 1936, and then South Down Plantation here, and that area of what it looks like today. So that was um, that's very interesting to see. As we all know, a lot of our um, farmland and sugarcane. Um, fields have developed into subdivision, ha in, into subdivisions, but we can see that now we it, it's the place of a lot of residents today. Okay, we have some other um, mills and, and plantations. We have South Coast Refinery, Refinery at Ashland. And then a few more mills. We have Live Oak that was on Bayou Grand Caillou. 
um, John A. Quitman owned and operated Live Oak Plantation. It was um, destroyed in a hurricane in 1926. It burned in 1907. Um, they produced 24,500 pounds of sugar there. And then we have Argyle, Argyle, Argyle Planning and Management Company. They had um, 12 rail railroad miles and 200 cane cars. I apologize for reading because I can't remember all of this <laughs> information. Um, and then Gibson was phased out in the 1920s. The next three si slides are statements of sugar and rice crops from 1885 to 1886. And I just highlighted some of the common names that you would maybe recognize today that, that are still in our area. Um, and this is from one of Dr. Sinak's books as well. Is that right, Marty? We have the McClellan's, the Schaefer's. Okay, so now we're showing the different ways of loading cane on, onto barges in Bayou Terrebonne, um, onto mule wagons in 1910 and 1938. And of course, as we know today, it's the process a is a lot easier. Um, this mechanical harvester made things a whole lot easier for, for everyone, for the workers. It, it kind of put a halt to actual manual labor, um, or it helped with reducing manual labor, should I say. And I think Dr. Rich is going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so... Um, there was so much information that I wanted to put together, but the main thing I wanted um, to address was on this, on this chart right here, the sugar houses in operation, um, I think I saw 92 in 1872, there were 92 sugar houses in operation in Terrebonne Parish. Like that just blew my mind. I think there are 11 in the state left today. So just from 92 in Terrebonne Parish to 11 now in the state, that's hard to believe. So agricultural crops would ha which had been grown in Terrebonne Parish for decades began their decline, and so did their importance. Um, so, of course, um, rice and cotton, which had been long raised as subsistence crops by local landowners, were for the most part phased out in the southeast. And then sugarcane was that main crop that took over and is still an agricultural staple today. Um, when, when I was first put on this committee, I did not realize that Easter lilies were grown in Terrebonne Parish to, um, to supply the United States and, and our area with Easter lilies because of the war. They could not get the Easter lilies, where they were getting them from. So here is um, a picture of an Easter lily field. They were grown in Berg, Montague, and Pontiché. In 1945. Okay, harvesting Easter lilies and preparing for shipping. County agent, Michael Andropont in Pontiché. Okay, frogs. <laughs> frogs were important <laughs> um, to our economy in Terrebonne Parish. And of course, we recognize, um, which is no longer open, but, and I, I have never, I never made it before it closed to Chester. <laughs>
moss, a beautiful and practical um, product here that we know was, was very versatile, used for mattresses, upholstery, um, insulation, packing material. There was a gin, a moss gin in Terrebonne Parish on East Park, and we'll show you a map in just a minute. I think one thing we can say about the people in Louisiana is they were very resourceful with everything that they had. So here are boats bringing in moss, curing the, the moss. And then this was a little funny. So um, Moss was ver a very hot commodity that if you went trespassed, um, Mr. Miner was going to make you pay for it. <laughs> okay, and then there's the, um, the Moss Gin and Bailing was located on East Park on Bayou Terrebonne near, near Central Avenue in 1931. Cotton was another commodity um, that was grown here. There were several, pl several plantation cotton gins. The last cotton gin in Terrebonne Parish was on East Park Avenue. And the cotton was, shipped, was, was brought to Mississippi where it was shipped out along the Mississippi. And then the, the cotton gin was located um, where the arrows are current location of downtown Marina. Okay, so um, I, I figured I would throw in part of the LSU Ag Center and 4-H in here because it, it links itself to, um, to agriculture. Um, I didn't print my notes, but anyway. <laughs> so um, the Cooperative Extension Service was started with the Smith-Lever Act shortly after 4-H um, started as first corn club for boys and canning club for girls. And um, the, the universities thought that it would be a good way um, for families to learn about um, the studies that were being done at the universities to teach the, the kids, and then the kids could go home and teach it to the families, and they would incorporate that on their family forms. Um, we, every s parish in the state has a cooperative extension service office. Um, myself and Mr. Barton Joffrey are here today from our office. Um, we have lots of volunteers. We recognize some volunteers today. We have a master gardener program that Barton works with um, to help um, learn different um, gardening and then to help with gardening within our community. Barton's called on a lot um, for different horticulture questions, whether it's fruit trees, a regular tree, something with the grass, Virginia buttonweed growing. Um, that's what the Cooperative Extension Service does. They also work with um, USDA and, and farmers within our community. Um, pictured here at the bottom was J.G. Richard, um, an extension agent. Um, I forgot what year that was. It was on my notes. Um, and then um, as 4-H'ers, um, as 4-H members, they can participate in livestock projects. Although we're, we're more of a rural parish, we still have 4-H'ers who show livestock. Um, we have 4-H'ers um, showing cattle through the years. I think a guest in the room is in this middle picture. I don't know if he recognizes himself, Mr. Lee. <laughs> You're on the end, that one on the end. <laughs> and then um, we also have beef grazing project, and that's that bottom picture to the right where 4-H members took records of their um, beef project 
over a year of raising those animals, just grazing on grass and hay, and that's what that picture is from. Um, 4-H also um, today has livestock, like I said, but our group focuses more on citizen citizenship, leadership, and our big program is shooting sports. Um, so if you see anything about 4-H, that's what we do now today. If y'all need anything, Barton's always there to answer questions as well. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Ms. Gale. Thank you, Cherie. Um, I'm Gail Cope, and I'm here to talk a little bit about Terrebonne Parish and farming because I grew up on a farm in Shriver, and the thing I want to talk about today is um, pro a project that took place in Terrebonne Parish <coughs> in 1937, well, 39 actually, to 1944. And that was called uh, Terrebonne Farms, and so that's what I'd like to talk about today. So as I said, I'm a native Terrebonne Parish resident. I've lived there all my life. I grew up on a sh farm in Shriver. And um, so Terrebonne Farms was a program that the government came into the area to um, to implement because they wanted, he wanted the farming needed to be um, expanded, and uh, the, the program was put in place during the years of 1939 to 1944, as I said before, under the administration of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So during this time, the area, the farms in the area were in really bad condition, and um, Th they had really been impacted by natural conditions in the 1920s when uh, boars and rot and disease and not to mention Johnson grass had kind of ruined all the farms. And so um, they were in very bad shape. So in 1924, there was a widespread drought and then a disastrous freeze in 1929 greatly impacted the production of sugarcane in the area. And so finally, because of the devastating effects all these conditions had on farming in the area and the depression of the 1930s, President Roosevelt saw the need to boost the economy by promoting farming and allowing families to be employed and pay taxes and thus, you know, in hoping to rebuild the economy. And so in July of 1935, a group of farmers, local farmers, met with the Secretary of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. to discuss the importance of government support for the sugarcane industry. They also met with the resettlement administration directed to discuss the possibility of re resettlement for some of these uh, for, for families to come and to help in the farming. And so under the Farm Security Administration and as part of Roosevelt's New Deal um, plan, he offered a project that was developed and operated in Shriver known as Terrebonne Farms. Once the government selected Terrebonne Parish as the spot as the place where they wanted it to be, uh, it, they began looking for land that they could purchase, that the government could purchase. And so the government purchased four plantations in Shriver. They purchased uh, St. George, Waban, Juvia, and um, Isle of Cuba. And, and s nearly 6,000 acres was purchased during that time. 
and the going price per acre was $55, if you can imagine that. And so in January of 1939, Helen Ellender, the wife of uh, the Senator Alan J. Ellender, ceremoniously broke ground for the project. And the Farm Security Administration uh, appointed three people to head it up. And um, <coughs> these were government appointees. And <coughs> the first one was George, <coughs> excuse me, George uh, Hartman was the director of the project. I. C. Borland was the senior farm manager and uh, management supervisor, and Mrs. Ruth Liner was the home manager supervisor. So in January of 1939, they began to plan and build houses in the area. And these houses, many of them are still standing today, but these houses were <coughs> built of pine, as you can imagine, pine in South Louisiana instead of cypress, but they seem to have held up pretty good. And so they were, they were houses were built. They were three bedrooms, uh, a screen porch, uh, uh, open porch in the front, no bathrooms because there was no indoor plumbing. and um, it included the plot for the homes, it was a six acre plot, and it included a, a barn, the house, the barn, chicken house, an outdoor toilet, a water cistern, and, and included in all of that was two mules, two cows, a corn crib, a tool shed, and fencing. And of course, there was no indoor plumbing, gas, or electricity. Each plot had six acres, and two of the acres was for the for the homestead, uh, and then four acres was used for the family to grow a garden and to have their livestock and their uh, chickens and whatever else they had, as far as animals went. And so the total cost of each complete homestead averaged about $2,600 for all of that house, born, all of that. And they were built of pine, as I said, and each one was painted white, had a light yellow trim, and they were spaced uh, five, most of them were spaced 500 feet apart except for some of them that were located on Highway 24 in the front. There were about eight of them there, and those were some of those were a little closer together. So, but many of those homes are still there today. If you drive through Shriver and you uh, drive down Main Project Road or Back Project or even on Highway 24, you, you might recognize some of those houses because they all look alike. Well, they don't all look alike. There's four different styles. Uh, of houses and um, so but a lot of them still remain a lot of families still live in those houses uh, my mom and dad's house is still there I, we my husband and I built right across from where I grew up from my mom and dad's house they have since passed away but my nephew lives in the house and uh, and he had a lot of damage during Ida but the actual house itself was not damaged. The carport flew away, and the and the utility room flew away. That was added on, and uh, but that house is still there, and uh, so they were well built back then. <laughs> and so, Terrebonne Farms organized a group with local people. This is this was with local people. It was called the Terrebonne Association. And they financed uh, the program through a loan from the Farm Security Administration, and the loan was used to construct those houses and barns and all of those things that we talked about. And the Terrebonne Association's annual rent to the government for the use of the land was a fifth share of the sugar cane <coughs> and a fourth share of all the other crops. The Terrebonne Association was a self-governing group and conducted business through a 12-man board. They had a board of directors. They had meetings. Uh, when, you, you, when you would talk to people that lived through this time, they said meetings, <coughs> meetings. They always had meetings, and 
and they each person was allowed one vote, and so they had a lot of business to take care of. So we're back up just a little bit to 1938, and during that time, um, ads were put in the local paper and you know, around Homa, Thibodeau, and the surrounding areas, and ads were put in the paper to uh, seek families who might want to relocate and come to Shriver. And um, my mom and dad came. They lived in Berg. They uh, had been married over a, a year. And um, they came in March of 1941. My mom always said, we moved to Shriva with $8 in our pocket and a baby in a blanket. And the and they had to pay a neighbor to move them because they had no vehicle. And, of course, a lot of people didn't have vehicles during that time. But it was tough times. And so my dad's bro uh, sister and her husband had already been here on the project. And um, they talked to mom and dad and said, why don't you all come and give it a try, you know? And so they thought, well, we don't have much to lose. We only have eight dollars, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so... So they did. They moved to Shriver, and it was kind of interesting to hear them talk. People talk about moving to Shriver because they, you could choose which house you wanted. You know, they were there were so many of them empty, and so they chose the house they wanted, and that's where we've been ever since. You know, I was born there, and so they were, you know, they were seeking families, and they were looking for people. You know, the articles, you know, stated about. Uh, People should have a good reputation and and uh, that sort of thing. Mama said they checked you for everything. They checked. They did health checks. They um, it was a thorough examination. <laughs> if you see if you were worthy of you know being a part of all of this. And so the the fields, the cooperative fields, uh, were planted uh, in sugarcane and. They were also used for growing corn, soybeans, and potatoes. And each farmer worked. They didn't come there and to be lazy. They couldn't. They worked hard. And so they worked from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. That was their day. And 15 minutes for breakfast and 90 minutes for their noon meal. So they had a, a long, hard day of work. If the crops were good on... Um, on Saturday, they just worked a half a day. And then on, on Saturdays and Sundays, the family could uh, give their time to working in their gardens and, and doing their uh, planting and gardening. And, of course, there was a, um, a building built for them to sell their produce. It was built, it was located there by kind of the base of the overpass. We all, it was called the three-way and it was in that little area right there where they had a stand where people could sell their produce. And so the, par the farmers paid the association a dollar entrance fee and a $30 annual uh, rental fee. And in return, the head of each family worked on the cooperative acre as a day laborer earning the current rate for sugarcane farming, which was $1.50 a day for harvesting and a dollar twenty a day for cultivating cane. So the pay was very low. My dad said he started he must have started on the bottom because he said he earned fifty cents a day and then he got an increase to a dollar a day and that's when he bought his <laughs> bicycle <laughs> so he could get around. And um because nobody they didn't have vehicles back then. Nobody did on the on in Shriver there. And so the men had to meet every morning at the um, headquarters, which is with the Walden um, Plantation House. And so they had to meet there and get their assignment for the day. And then they'd go to the Mewborn, which was located uh, present day um, Morgan City Highway and Brunei Street, which is in Walden Subdivision, if anybody's familiar with that area. And that's where the Mewborn was. And so they'd go to the Mewborn. And, you know, by then my dad could ride his bicycle to there. So that was kind of interesting <laughs> for him. It was a little better than having to walk. And uh, so they, you know, they got their assignments for the day, and they always had a, 
uh, supervisor or foreman that was there to make sure the work was carried out and done correctly. And uh, tractor driving was like the most desirable job. That was the best job. It paid $1.85 a day in 1940. And many of the other jobs paid 10 to 50 cents a day. So the workers, uh, you know, they had to go to that mule barn every morning, get their mules. I remember our mules. We had two. Hmm. They were Molly and Nancy. I remember our mules. And, and I was really young, but I can remember Daddy uh, hooking that mule up to that plow, you know, and plowing in the garden. And, and um, by the time I was born, this had dissolved. It was no longer, the project was no longer in, in existence, but the farmers were still there. They still, many of them stayed. And, um, and so I, World War II officially, officially ended September 2nd, 1945, and I was born about two weeks later. And so I, I didn't live through this time, but, um, but I, I remember all the farming, and I remember, you know, Daddy doing all that farming and all the other neighbors, and it was just, it was just a good, it was a good atmosphere. It was a good community. People cooperated with each other. They helped each other. They worked together. And so um, in 1945, the land was divided into plots of 60 to 100 acres. And the people that stayed, a, a lot of them left. About 32 families stayed on the project. We keep calling it a project. That's what it was. And... Um, and so about 32 families stayed, and um, the plots were divided, and the government allowed them to buy, purchase land. And so most of, a lot of them, like my dad, bought 100 acres. And this was a loan through the government with a 40 years to repay this loan. And um, the government also was holding uh, oil lease on this property, the, all this land. And so they sold the oil lease back to the, they sold, not back, but they sold it to the farmers. And so that was a huge help in allowing these people that lived there, you know, that were buying this property and had that big loan. And it, it, it allowed them to pay off those loans a lot earlier than they could have otherwise. And, you know, that was a big, big help. Mom was so excited because she said they paid their loan off in 13 years. It didn't take them 40, so she was real happy about that. And so, um, hmm, I think that's about all that I can say about it, except that I have a little, a uh, few pictures. <laughs> and, um, if you put those up, we'll just kind of comment on these. These photographs were taken by a government uh, photographer. Oh, I can do the clicking. Okay, these were by Marion uh, Post Wilcott. She was. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> this is. Um, this is one of the houses. You might reckon uh, this is like my mom and dad's house. And, um, and this is one of the houses that were built on the project. This was like from the very beginning. Um, mules, you know, carts, just another farming picture. I remember some of that equipment. Like, I don't know what we called it, but you know, those mules pull those, those farming implements. That's the mule barn. Had a lot of mules. More mules. And, of course, the tractors. There weren't a lot of tractors. This was during the war years, and tractors were not being manufactured because, you know, all, the, all that... Uh, metal, whatever, all had to be used for the war effort, so there weren't a lot of tractors. More of the farming. That's Main Project Road. That's where I lived. 
And uh, that's what it looked like way back then. Now it's a whole lot different. Lots of houses. Mm. Another house. Another my neighbor's house looks like that one. And of course, the families. A lot. Of, there were some large families. One of, one of the families had 18 children. And um, yeah. And Miss Ruth Liner was the. Uh, she would. She taught the women so many things: uh, sewing, canning, cooking. Uh, you know, it was good opportunities. It was good opportunities for these people. And that's Miss Madge with her little jars of food. This was that stand I told you about, that vegetable stand. It was located in what we call the three-way area. And that's Main Project Road again. Hmm. This is at the very end of the Project Road near Morgan City Highway. And that's it. Yes. So, <laughs> if you were ever in Shriver and you have ever wondered why these roads were called main project, back project, front, we call it, we actually call it front project and, um, I think I have the, we actually called it front project and back project. Thank you, Ms. Gale. And Ms., um, Mr. Prosper introduced me to Ms. Gale's book. She has a book that she wrote on Shriver and the project, um, th the farm project. And it was very interesting. And like she said, they worked hard on that farm. Um, so I want to thank you for presenting and promoting agriculture. So All right, next. Next on our agenda, we have um, Wilson J. Gagery III from Residence Plantation. He and his wife, Miss Wanda, have been very helpful for, um, for this research, letting me go visit and talking to me all about Residence Plantation. So we're going to hear from him today. Uh, you can turn the light. Let me see if I can read this. I can see the pictures from here. Uh, my name is Wilson Gadry. I'm a fifth generation farmer in Terrebonne Parish. Uh, we farm residence plantations since 1928, which is the oldest continually operated, uh, owned and operated farm in Terrebonne Parish. Uh, it, it, I'll give you some events, historical events, that led to the, uh, to the farming operation here. The first most important event was the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Until that time, the, uh, most of the, uh, the, the parish was populated by uh, first wave, you had French from uh, France, and the second was the uh, expelled Acadians from Nova Scotia. But there was no really big plantations in Terrebonne Parish as such. In 1803, the Louisiana Purchase, the English plantation owners on the East Coast in the North and South Carolina and Virginia, uh, they didn't want to come to Louisiana before that time because the French and the Spanish uh, more or less uh, were governors of the state, but that uh, that let allowed the uh, immigration to Louisiana of the big plantation owners from the uh, from the East Coast, North and South Carolina, and that's when the the bar they they settled a lot in North Louisiana in the Red River parishes. They raised cotton and tobacco, and uh, and uh, the second biggest event. 
that led to this uh, this uh, plantation was in uh, in uh, the late 1700s. Up until that time, uh, Terrebonne Parish and the coastal parishes, the high humidity was not very suitable for cotton and tobacco. And the only thing we could really raise down here as a cash crop was indigo. Well, the indigo failed in the late 1700s because you had several diseases of rust and a nematode. So the indigo was failing. And the third biggest event was in uh, 1795, when Anton de Boer, who had the plantation where Audubon Park is in New Orleans, crystallized sugar. And it started the sugar industry, which, which uh, was a boon. And Terrebonne Parish, Lafouche, South Louisiana, with its high humidity and its, its high organic soils were ideal for, for the sugar industry. In, uh, in, the, in the early 1800s, about 1820, uh, you had this migration of the English plantation owners from the Carolinas and, uh, and Virginia. Uh, they, they, you could sell 100 acres of land in North Carolina and buy 1,000 acres of land in Louisiana. So these people came, that's where the big plantations really started. Was was from uh, from that influx, and that's where you had uh, the Barrows had first settled around St. Francisville, Barrow Street, and home is named after, and that was a great great grandfather that started all this. Barrow uh, Barrow Street and home is named after. They first settled in St. Francisville, and uh, uh, Bartholomew Barrow was one of the Barrows had a son called Ruffin G Barra, Ruffin, Robert Ruffin Barra, or R. Barra. And Barra Street, as I said, is named after him. He came to Homer in uh, 1828, and that's when the farm that I'm running right now started, was in 1828. With uh, 50, he talked his daddy into giving him $1,500, a pair of mules, a pair of uh, a workmen, and he had came to Terrebonne Parish with a horse named Tom Bennett. He bought just about everything from the intercoastal to Presquillo with that $1,500. He bought Honduras Plantation, Muddle Grove, a Roberta Grove, Residence Plantation, all where the air base is. And he established it. At that time, after the Boer granulated the sugar, Barra had seen that the, the first sugar plantations started along the Mississippi River. Uh, Destrahan was uh, Du Bois' father-in-law. And Destrahan Plantation, and the, it started on the Mississippi, but the, the land was cheaper than Terrebonne at that time. And Barra realized that sugarcane was where, the, where the, the money was. He talked his father into making an investment here. He built a sugar house where uh, on Presque Isle, that was in 1828. Well, the, some of the richest people in, in the United States at that time, by the 1840s and 1850s, were the sugar planters and the sugar, the sugar mills. And by 1840, eight, uh, and, and late 1840s, Barra had 13 plantations. He had Donaldsonville Plantation, Residence Plantation, Honduras, uh, Kaya Grove. He had plantations in Terrebonne, Lafourche, St. Mary's, Assumption uh, Parish, and even some in Texas. He, was a, he became the richest man in Louisiana uh, by 1850. Uh, he, but he was generous with his, with his money. He, he uh, gave the money. He donated the property for the San Francis de Sale Church and Cemetery. The Episcopal Church and Cemetery, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, and he donated the property and material for the first black church in Terrebonne Parish. And it's still, it's still there today. It's two blocks off of Main Street on Grand Kaya. And he hired, uh, well, he enticed uh, a free man of color, Isaiah Lawson, to be the pastor. He did this in 1855 to be the pastor of the church and to help educate the black children. 
Uh, so, and then one of his biggest contributions was that they couldn't get the sugar cane to New Orleans. They didn't have any, back in the early 1800s, they didn't have any good transportation. The, there was a canal, a company called the B&L Number no. 1, which was uh, Dr. Brasher, who was from around Morgan City, you, the streets in Morgan City. In fact, Morgan City was named Brasher. They started uh, an idea to dig a canal from Bayou Terrebonne to the Mississippi River so that they could get the, comma, the produce out from Bayou Lafourche and Bayou Terrebonne. Well, the canal went bankrupt, and Barrow bought out the B&L number, number one, and he started the B&L number two, which is called the Company Canal at Boy. And he had a set of locks in Lockport. Lockport is named after his locks. And he had, st and the steamboats, in a day's time, could transport the sugar and oil to New Orleans. So that, and this this canal system was later bought in 1927 by the Corps of Engineers, the government, and that became the intercoastal waterway that we know today. So that that was probably his major contribution. But he also did uh, several other things. He gave property to schools. Uh, and, tra and help try to finance schools. So that's the story of Barrows. Barrows came from, from North Carolina to San Francisville, and they had a lot of other families. I'm sure, I think the Schaffer family, family did the same thing. The Miners, the McCullins, they all were more or less uh, started out on the East Coast around Virginia. Is that right? Uh, uh -huh. South Carolina. Well, we, we came from North Carolina. But it was the same type of migration about the same time. And it was after the Louisiana Purchase. And uh, the Schaffers with Ardon and all was, was in that same migration of planters from the Carolinas, Virginia, over here. Because they could buy, like I said, they could sell 100 acres over there and buy 1,000 acres over here. So that was the main thing. Barra died in, uh, in uh, 1873. Uh, and uh, you know I'm not, and uh, he, that was Barrow's house, by the way, and that's a picture of uh, Ruff and Barrow. He was a tall guy, about six one, and uh, very energetic. He stayed on top of it. Show the picture of the house, the old house. That was the first house. That's at the same location as Reverend, but it burnt around 1860, 1870. Go to the next one. Okay. So that's, uh, we have a grit mill on the farm. Back then, there wasn't too much dry for grain. Huh? <laughs> at that time, they, at that time, there wasn't too much rice and grain, so grits was used as a staple. People ate grits for, in place of rice. They had cornbread, and we have the original grits mill that, that was brought, brought from San Francisville uh, on the property. The, uh, but Barra died in 1873, and his daughter had was inherited uh, the plantations and sell the plantations. She was a teenager. She had no, uh, she didn't know anything about agriculture. She was a poor businesswoman. That's the little girl in the picture, the life-size picture is at, the, is at the plantation home. And she was almost ready to lose the plantation uh, at that time. And there was a lot of factors that was coming into that. The sugarcane bore was just starting to, uh, to affect the sugarcane industry. So they were having a lot of problems with that. But fortunately, her daughter, and let's see if you can go down to Clara and, uh, and Wilson. Well, her daughter built the present house. That's, that's the Lumley house. That's the daughter. She married a, a Cade, Arcadian, uh, Wilson Gadry, who could work hard, and he had a good business sense. And he came in and started diversifying, besides sugarcane, into truck crops, potatoes, beans. Uh, and it, at that particular time, this would have been about 1890, 1900, they had a, uh, I remember the railroad track was right where uh, 
and a lot of the South Louisiana seed is right in that area. And they were shipping uh, beans and potatoes and all out by railroad. And uh, they also, uh, Wilson had a few head of cattle, Clower had chicken, and they began, in, they began raising, uh, selling milk and eggs. Now there's the old milk wagon. Uh, let's see if we have that somewhere. The, uh, the old, you see the residence dairy milk wagon, and we still have that. We, that's down on the plantation. We have so many uh, museum quality artifacts down there, I have hundreds of them. But he started selling milk and eggs in Homer, and, uh, and later on they got a truck and they started expanding the dairy business. They always did have, um, have besides the dairy business, they diversified. They had truck crops, potatoes, beans, and, uh, but the dairy business, after the oil fields started to come in for Terrebonne, people, the population started expanding and people needed more and more milk. So the dairy, the dairy really started being the, the, main, uh, the main money maker for the plantation. And it, by, by World War II, the end of World War II, and I'm old enough to remember World War II, we were up to, uh, to 5,000 quarts a day sold by milk truck, both resale and wholesale. But we still, we still um, were, were truck cropping. At that time, we were, bringing, uh, we were bringing vegetables to New Orleans twice a week, potatoes and beans and all on a Mondays and a Thursday. And uh, <coughs> after, uh, in, in about, 1960, late 50s or 1960, the dairy business was doing fine, but the oil field was the, the competition for labor. You couldn't pay your workmen on a, on, a, on a dairy what the oil field was paying. And then the big companies were coming in, seal test and bordens were coming into Terrebonne Parish, and they were doing just like what the Walmarts were doing we could see the handwriting on the wall, my father and I. Just like what the Walmarts are doing today, the seal test and bordens could come into a town and sell milk for five cents a quart and put the little dairies out of business. So we decided to diversify again into, uh, we got beef cattle. Well, that was the truck that we hauled vegetables in the, the late 20s and 30s, and that's on the farm. We restored it. Like I said, we have uh, all type of old farm, horse-drawn equipment. We have, uh, we, we were diversified and into the cattle business. We got beef cattle, and we started uh, raising beef cattle, and, uh, and that's what we have now, a, a cattle and hay operation. We make a million and a half pounds of hay every year, and we have 300 head of cattle. And we continue to, to diversify into pine forests in North Louisiana and all. But the reason, I guess, that this thing has survived from, uh, it's probably the oldest business, I would think, in Terrebonne Parish. Uh, it was going to be 200 years old in 2028. And uh, it was, to stay in business that long, I think, I think is an accomplishment. And uh, we, I hope the parish that uh, we can contribute to the economy and uh, the benefit of Terrebonne Parish in the future. And uh, you know, I love this parish, but we're going to have a lot of real, real bad challenges in the future. And the main, the main one right now is the global rise in sea level, particularly in Terrebonne Parish. It's going to be a big, big problem in the future. In my lifetime, the sea level has risen about two foot in Bayer Terrebonne right here. And, it, well, and the bad part about it is it's risen one foot in the last 10 years. So this is going to be a big thing. And uh, I hope you all have enjoyed this, and I thank you all very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, what you got here from? It's a tatala bui pie. So thank I want to thank um, I, a lot of people call him Doc, but I want to I want to thank Mr. Wilson and Miss Wanda um, 
for their hospitality and helping with this presentation. And I'm glad he decided to present. He wasn't going to do it at first. <laughs> Miss Wanda might have might have had something to do with that, um, but I want to thank them. They also um, have some some artifacts here from the farm that they allowed us to use to present. And um, if you ever have a chance to go by there, um, they've opened the plantation as a museum, and so it's it's really nice. Yes, it's. Right over the twin span. How how do I explain? Not um yeah over. East on East Park. Yeah. Can't miss it. I'm gonna show you. Um, can you bring can you bring it back up again? I'll show you the present day house. What it looks like. And I passed it every day forever and didn't realize what was in that house and the history there. That's Residence Plantation. How do you get to tour it? <laughs> All right, while, while Doc's passing out the cards, we'll move on to um, our last presentation for the night, and that is with Dr. Rich Johnson from USDA Research Station here in Terrebonne Parish. Thank you, Dr. Rich. Well, yeah, I'm gonna just give a brief introduction first, okay. One over here. Hmm? Okay, good evening. As uh, Sherry said, I'm Rich Johnson. I'm currently the acting research leader from the USDA Sugarcane Lab across the street. And um, it's been very interesting listening to the history of Terrebonne Parish here. And I'd like to uh, remind you that the Sugarcane Research Unit is part of that long history. And it's been there. We're coming up on our 100th anniversary. And uh, the, the story of how we got here is very interesting. And it's all about sugarcane. And obviously, um, we've already heard about sugarcane first being crystallized in New Orleans at Audubon Park in the 1790s. And that sugarcane that they first grew, and it's probably a sugarcane, the type of sugarcane a lot of you recognize is the big cane, the purple cane. And that's what we call true noble cane. And that, what, what, that's the cane that was widely grown all the way through the 1800s in Louisiana. It was very productive. It was the cane that was originally brought from the Caribbean by the Jesuits to this area, and it was very pr productive all the way through the 1800s. The problem was, at the beginning of the 1900s, going from probably 1915 to 1920, this type of cane started to fail. We, ha we had widespread crop failures. The yield started to really go down significantly, and people were losing money. So they sent out an SOS to USDA, and USDA was there. The organization, um, I was asked earlier what ARS stands for. In, in, the, in the program, it says USDA ARS. Well, ARS stands for Agricultural Research Service, and that's the agency that I work for. In the 1920s, that agency did not exist. But there were scientists that worked for USDA. USDA was created by Abraham Lincoln if you didn't know that, so it had been there for a very long time. So when they got the message, they got the SOS, they sent some scientists down to this area, they studied the situation, and what they found out, it was a disease 
that was um, causing the problem. It was called sugarcane mosaic disease. And the, the noble canes that were brought from the Caribbean were highly susceptible to this disease. And there was really, they could find no varieties that were resistant to this. So there was kind of a dilemma. What do we do? We can't, we don't want to lose the industry. So what the scientist, Dr. Brandis, was the USDA scientist, what he figured out <coughs> was we needed some new blood into the, the sugar cane here in Louisiana. So they went all the way to, the in, into, to Indonesia and Java, where the Dutch were actually experimenting with crossing wild sugar cane with this true noble cane. And they were having a lot of success with this process. And so he was able to get some of this material, and he brought it back to Homa. And he introduced that to the, to the sugarcane system here, and they started to make crosses. <coughs> so we started to make crosses between our noble canes and this wild cane from Indonesia, and they found that they could get resistance to mosaic. And it was actually much more productive, you had higher yields, better sugar, just all around, a huge improvement. So at that time, you know, there were, uh, we had other partners when this process was going on, and of course they were Louisiana State University was one of the partners, and the other partner was the American Sugar Cane League. The American Sugar Cane League has their office in Thibodeau, and they represent all of the sugar cane growers in the state. But they were back there in 1925 is when this all went down. And we, at that time, we formed what we call a three-way agreement. So that's between LSU, the American Sugar Cane League, and USDA. And the agreement is to produce new sugar cane varieties for Louisiana and also to develop new technology and new methods to grow sugar cane. And that agreement gets signed every five years. And at that has been signed continuously since 1925. <coughs> and we'll have our 100th anniversary coming up in, in uh, 2025. So that's how we got here. Uh, the presence, uh, we started our first building was built in 1925. The land was donated from Southdown Plantation. And that's when the, our facility started. And it has, <coughs> excuse me, it has grown over time. Okay, sorry. Better? I'm sorry. Okay, so since 1925, we have uh, grown in what we did. We started out doing sugarcane varieties, but now we, we've grown into, now we have nine different or eight different scientists doing a wide range of research that covered all of the sugarcane production system. And so what I want to do today is um, to give you the full story. We actually recently developed a video that goes over the whole, um, the start of our, our industry, the start of our facility, and it also talks about the research that we're gonna be doing in the future and also that we're doing currently. And what I really am excited about is you get to see our individual scientists talk about their work. And you'll also get to see some pictures of our older facility and our current facility. So. With that, I think we can go ahead and start the video, and then if you have any questions at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. Sugar. You've probably checked it off your grocery list, measured it carefully as you prepared a recipe, or simply enjoyed it when eating your favorite treat. But did you know that every grain in your cupboard comes from a crop that has been the cornerstone of Louisiana agriculture for more than 220 years? An industry with an economic impact of approximately $3 billion. The crop is sugarcane. Historically, sugar is one of the oldest commodities, its value being recognized as far back as 1803. Louisiana is the northernmost point on the planet where sugarcane is grown commercially, which added value to our country's most significant land deal known as the Louisiana Purchase. Not only did this double the size of the nation, but it also solidified Louisiana's status as a state 
and marked its place in the global economy. Sugarcane's prolific history is fascinating, but the modern day story goes beyond the traditional notions of farming and manufacturing. As soon as the founding fathers saw the potential of this crop, they entrusted Louisiana's industry with preserving its legacy. Since 1922, specialized scientists have cultivated, researched, and protected this plant with the encouragement and support of the growers and millers of the American Sugarcane League. It is here in Houma, Louisiana that the United States Department of Agriculture's Sugarcane Research Initiative is housed. This historic home known as the Sugarcane Research Unit became a dedicated research facility in 1923 under the USDA, forwarding the cause a full 30 years before Agricultural Research Service was founded. The program's establishment ensured the sugarcane industry's longevity, revitalizing the fledgling USDA research program. As the USDA's principal sugarcane research entity, it is responsible for both plant breeding and cultural practices, as well as soil and water science that have defined Louisiana's prominence in the sugarcane industry. A few miles from the sugarcane research unit lies the Ardon Research Farm. Here, specialists continue their hands-on research. Planting, harvesting, and laboratory and field work all contribute to the decades-long processes supporting the industry in creating new varieties of sugarcane, improving disease of weed and insect management, calibrating nutrient requirements, and developing sustainable production practices. Our primary mission here at the Sugarcane Research Unit is to meet the needs of the stakeholders, the sugarcane industry here. We have a wide range of disciplines here to meet the various needs of the industry. We have nine, what I would call project leaders. We have three projects, which in the jargon uh, is often referred to as Chris projects. Uh, one is the breeding Chris. This particular Chris project has three scientists assigned to it. This unit was requested to be organized back in the early 1920s by the industry to develop new varieties that are adapted to the uh, Louisiana temperate climate. My name is Anna Hale, and I'm a plant breeder. I'm in charge of the breeding program. And specifically, I'm in charge of what we call basic breeding or the germplasm enhancement program, where we use wild species that are related to sugarcane, and we look at traits of interest in those and we breed them into sugarcane. We'll make a hybridization and we take those offspring and we select them and then we cross the best of those offspring back to some more sugarcane. And each time we cross it back to sugarcane, the sugar levels come up and we maintain the trait of interest in it. And it's a 20 to 30 year process before we get a commercial return on that. I came to the United States of America, 1984. I'm focusing in genetics, and uh, sugarcane genetics also appears to me. Sugarcane is a, a very tough crop. You know, what I try to uh, contribute to the sugarcane breeding program or pathology program here is to develop or even trans technically transfer some useful tools to guide, you know, the, the, the breeding program. My name is James Todd, and I'm the commercial breeder. And my job is to develop new varieties for Louisiana. Louisiana is a unique environment for sugarcane anyway, because it's a, a late temperate where we have to breed sugarcane that can produce a lot earlier than the rest of the world. For instance, we'll have a, we'll start our harvest in September, and then we end ours in December, where some will start in October and continue on all the way in through May, like they do in Florida. So we have to develop sugar, commercial sugarcane varieties that have high sugar content early. If you talk with Dr. Anna Hale, we use we start bringing in her varieties, which have wild material that have been brought into them 
we start intercrossing those into the program too, which helps us, helps us to gain some of that extra cold tolerance and extra vigor for retuning that we need. And it's my job to sort of take some of that material on and make crosses with it and develop more. Uh, we have a second uh, CRISP project that is concerned primarily with crop production and protection. Uh, I actually fall under that CRISP as well as a plant pathologist, but it includes an entomologist, weed scientist, and an agronomist who covers a lot of areas such as fertility, uh, precision agriculture, and some of these areas. Hey, my name is Rich Johnson, and I'm a research agronomist, and I'm currently the lead scientist of a project here at the Sugarcane Research Unit that's called uh, Crop Production and Crop Protection. When we plant the crop, what are the different fertilizers we have to use when we get the crop established? Are there other chemicals or other products that we need to make sure we get a good crop? How do we plant it? How deep do we plant it in the soil? How, do we, how much soil do we put on top? How do we cultivate all these different things, get fed into this idea of cultural practices. With sugarcane, it's, it's, it's more complicated than a normal crop. Sugarcane is a perennial crop. So what that means is, you know, we, we plant it once, but we're able to harvest it multiple times before we have to reestablish and plant the crop. So that brings some unique challenges to us. We've put a little more emphasis on the fertilization side because that was an area in sugarcane in Louisiana, there really hadn't been too much research done in this area for 30 or 40 years. Based on the work we did, we were able to show the growers that we could reduce nitrogen rates by anywhere from 25 to 30 percent. We basically reduced our environmental impact and still maintain yields. So critically important work, and uh, I think it shows the success that we've had. In terms of uh, the research that I'm more responsible for is the pathology. This is the study of diseases of sugarcane. Much of the diseases of sugarcane are managed primarily through resistant varieties, so our project works very closely with the breeders in developing resistant varieties. We have a few diseases that can be managed by cultural practices, uh, so we uh, work in those areas. Our diseases range from viral diseases to bacterial diseases to fungal diseases, so we cover a pretty broad spectrum, but uh, we have an excellent uh, group that works on these pathology programs. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, two technicians that combined have over 50 years of, of experience. And this is not unusual for a lot of our projects. Uh, people enjoy working here, they make a career here, and we get the advantage of them uh, being dedicated to, to, their, to their work and to, the, to meeting the needs of the industry. So I'm Dr. Hannah Penn. I'm the research entomologist here at the USDA ARS Sugarcane Research Unit. Um, and a lot of what I do is evaluate sugarcane varieties and different control mechanisms for pests of sugarcane. So our biggest one right now that we're looking at is the sugarcane borer. Um, and it's been the biggest pest in Louisiana sugarcane. Honestly, since we've been growing sugarcane in Louisiana, that destroys the sugar content. In some fields with bad damage, you can have 20% loss of your sugar content. We also have some other hemipteran pests, which are sucking insects. Um, so we have the sugarcane aphid. We also have the yellow sugarcane aphid um, and some mealybugs and delphases that we're, we're kind of looking at to make sure that they don't get too out of control. We have chemical control, which is what you normally think of like insecticides, varietal control, so that the varieties that the breeders are developing, some of them are really resistant to the sugarcane borer. We also have uh, biological control. Um, so that one's actually my favorite um, because we rely heavily on the fire ants. We dug up fire ants from the field and we brought them into the lab and we were looking at the biological control. So that way we make sure that we actually keep our fire ants uh, nice and healthy so that way they can do the biological control and prevent the sugarcane borer damage. We can use the behavior and the ecology of these insects in the communities that they're in to make healthier decisions in terms of the plants but also in terms of people and environmental health, right? So we can minimize cost to farmers which is great for their bottom line and then we can make the environment a little bit safer for everybody. And then we have a third project that's involved with uh, natural resources. 
Uh, this project looks at soil and water relationships, soil health, uh, microbial activity, all of these kind of things. So we have two scientists in that field. One is very much a uh, soil microbiologist, uh, and another is the plant physiologist. My name is Patrick Ellsworth. I am a research plant physiologist. As a plant physiologist, I specialize in whole plant physiology. The main part of my research, what I'm interested in, is understanding how um, below ground affects above ground. Looking at how um, below ground traits, um, root structure and function, affects you know, sugar production. I'm also interested in how plants use water, uh, specifically what factors affect water use efficiency. Uh, and so how much biomass or how much sugar they produce uh, relative to how much water they use. So when we started a research program here, we really were focused on soil health. And soil health uh, being defined for us as getting the soil to a level and keeping it at a level to where we can expect um, economically successful yields, but also do it in a sustainable way where we aren't polluting the environment, where we are conserving our natural resources and again keeping these soils productive so that the next generation of growers that come along will have access to them. So what we're trying to do is apply what we know will work in a sugarcane system to try to improve management, particularly looking at how can we keep the crop sustainable for the next century. We try to keep the research oriented toward meeting the needs of the industry. The industry is very responsive to our research. They're demanding, they want good research done. Our people enjoy that because they want to know that the work they do is being effectively used in the industry. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope uh, I hear from a lot of folks that they didn't realize what was going on at the, on, out on Bull Run Road and Shreve. Well, this, this kind of tells you the story about we've been out there for, you know, quite a long time. We're going to be there. We currently, you know, uh, are actually looking to expand our facilities out on Bull Run, and we plan to be here for a while. So if you're interested in that video, it's on our website. The easiest way to find our website is if you type in USDA and sugarcane in Google, we're number one that comes up, okay? <laughs> so that's the easiest way to find us. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much. And Barton, um, right at the end of the presentation, said, ask, ask how many people knew this actually went on in Terrebonne Parish. And maybe some of you sitting in here did, but I bet the majority of the general public in Terrebonne Parish does not realize the amazing research that's being done at USDA. So we're thankful that it's here in our own backyard. Oh.
Awesome. Okay, and I do want to recognize our committee. Um, our committee is made up of Mr. Barton Joffreon. You want to? Okay. He's a hard culture agent. Um, Dustin Marlboro, who could not be here today. And um, I'm going to recognize Mr. Lee. Um, Lee Schaefer. Schaefer or Schaffer? Schaffer. Okay. Um, and, and someone who was not on our committee, but I do want to recognize, um, I want to recognize him because he helped me visualize agriculture long ago. And that's Mr. Prosper Toops. I think he said he wanted to, he didn't want to present today, but he did come with me on HTV yesterday, but he wanted to say a few words from there. I'm going to bring you the mic over here. The reason why <coughs> I'm here because uh, my father, Prosper Tube Sr., went to work for South Down as the overseer of Greenwood Plantation in 1933. This is right after the, uh, the Depression. The first year, realty operator, South Down realty, uh, realty operator said, we can't pay you, but if you save the crop, we, we'll keep you on. Now, he had a house, uh, the overseer's house at Greenwood, which is on 182 between Bayer Black and Gibson. And I always remember, the porch was 95 feet long, and the, uh, the bedrooms were 30 by 30, so uh, I always remember that. <coughs> but uh, can you, and he comes with his wife and uh, uh, his first daughter in 1933 and began working for South Down then, after the Depression, and how, th how tough things were. Now here in 1938, during the harvest season, he goes outside, and the mill is burning at South Down. Can you imagine what must have went through his mind, having a family, and the mill burnt down? The only thing that was left was the steel equipment, the mill. So South Down had, had to, to rebound from that. And the other thing I remember was that after the war, German prisoners were hired, were brought in from the, by the South Coast Corporation, and they worked uh, in the summertime, and their favorite was to get them a Hershey bar chocolate, you know. <laughs> and so we, we went out and we talked to them, and when they left, my father received about five or six letters from them asking how they could come back and live, live here. So uh, <clears throat> she contacted me, and here I am in the wrong place at the right time. But I feel, I feel honored, and I feel proud to have been able to serve you all with some of the little knowledge I had about uh, growing up on a plantation. From Greenwood in 33, making him overseer, promoting him to overseer in 1950, to South Down, and then he retired in 71, and then the mill closed in October of 1978 because of the oil industry and the real estate that took over the area. But that goes with growth, so those of us that are no old enough can remember what was presented here tonight. And then you see two people working, one driving a combine and one driving uh, a tractor with a wagon. You know back then how many people it took to do that one job? They could cut that row and load it within five minutes. You know how many mules and how many laborers it would have taken? And yesterday on TV I showed them a cane knife that someone used when they worked from cane to cane. And believe it or not, the best way to cut cane is with a sharp cane knife. And you look at a cane knife after the season and has a big uh, circle in it. Because every time you file a cane knife, you take a metal off, you know. So it was a pleasure, and it's an honor to have been here with you all tonight. Well, thank you. All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, again, thank you to everyone um, who helped with this presentation. We did um, recognize them on the back. And I do want to recognize South Down Plantation and Museum and um, Ms. Celeste Landry's father, who allowed us to use some of the um, artifacts on the, on the table to the far right as well. So thank you all. Yes.
Is that it?